Good evening. Welcome to Skeptics in the Pub Online. I'm Gerald, and I'm happy that so many of you have connected tonight to follow our talk. Great to see. Short word about us. We used to meet in various pubs around the UK and abroad, but this is the age of COVID, so we had to put our heads together and we started these talks online. Since we did so, um, we kind of developed a little community that we are quite happy to have. So a good example of this community is our Discord server, which I would like you all to maybe consider joining if you haven't done so yet. You will find all the details for how to join on our website at sitp.online forward slash contact. Um, during the talk, our chat moderators will provide the link repeatedly throughout the evening. About tonight will be the usual format. We have a talk about 45 minutes. We'll have a short break for refreshments and comfort breaks, and then we'll have a Q&A with our speaker. If you want to ask a question for the Q&A, please follow the following instructions. Go to sitp.online forward slash ask, and there you will be able to enter your question. You will also be able to see questions that already have been raised, and you can upvote them if you like them. And the most popular questions we will obviously ask first. You do not need an account to use that web page. But if you put your name on there, it will make it more personal when we read out the questions. That's enough housekeeping. Let's talk about tonight and our guest speaker. Dr. Emma Chapman is a Royal Society Research Fellow and a Fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society. She's among the world's leading researchers in search of the first stars to exist in our universe. And she's involved in both the Low Frequency Array in the Netherlands and the forthcoming Square Kilometer Array in Australia, a telescope that will finally consist of a million antennas pointing out there into the sky. She is a recipient of multiple commendations and prizes for her work, but academia is not her only hunting ground. She's also a respected public commentator on astrophysical matters, contributing to The Guardian, appearing on the BBC radio, and regularly speaking in public events like the Cheltenham Science Festival. We skeptics love scientists who also care about science communication, which is why we are extremely honored to welcome you, Emma, tonight as our guest speaker. Thank Everyone you. Everyone in the chat, please fill it with clapping and a lot of shouts of approval <laughs> for Dr. Emma Chapman. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a really kind, um, very kind introduction. Um, are you okay for me to start? Yeah, OK, great. Um, well, thank you so much for coming to hear me talk this evening. Um, I've given two skeptics talks before, one in a pub uh, in Medway and one in my local tea shop where they gave me cake at the end of it. So I am I'm a little bit sad to be doing it online, but also happy because I'm in my slippers. So it's it's all one or the other, really. So let's get on with it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research and really try and pass on my enthusiasm for the first stars and why you should care about these entities. And before I get on to that, I should say that I used to not care. Um, sorry, I used to not care at all about it. When I was a child, I didn't spend my time looking through little mini telescopes or learning the constellations. Instead, what I was looking at was Egyptology. I was um, a real fan of anything to do with the pharaohs or hieroglyphics, decoding this dead language. And um, there's one story which really excited me the most, and I think it excited most Egyptophiles, to be honest, and that's the discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun. So this happened in the early uh, 20th century, and what we had is we had Lord Carnarvon um, and Howard Carter and what they did was they found an unopened tomb in the deserts of Egypt. And this is incredible because actually most of the tombs in Egypt had been raided far, far before anybody rediscovered them. But this one was pristine and it had a sealed door. And as Howard Carter drilled a hole and chipped away at that hole and held up a candle to that door, Lord Carnarvon said, what can you see? What can you see? And Howard Carter just replied, wonderful things, wonderful things. And there's a reason that I think we get so obsessed with history and our, um, our ancestry. 
and we're obsessed with filling out our family trees we go on these programs like who do you think you are where do you think you come from I can't remember <laughs> um, we we look at the human evolution with real fascination about what what our human ancestry was as a species and the past in itself it's a, we we love it from a very very young age like I did we love archaeology we love discovering unopened tombs we love dinosaurs even far back as that we're obsessed with them as children and of course, the other one of the holy triad of interest as a kid is, of course, space. And space is what I eventually ended up in. Uh, and the reason for that is because I just didn't understand it. I went to university. I changed from Egyptology because I found a book about time travel. And I thought, my goodness me, this must be sci-fi. And it turned out to be special relativity. Um, and that blew my mind. I didn't understand it. So I went to university. And then someone told me that, you know, the universe was expanding with dark energy and there was this mysterious stuff called dark matter and that blew my mind. So I went to study that um, because I didn't understand it. And I still don't really understand it today. <laughs> I go to work every day not understanding something, which is how science should be. So today I am going to talk to you about my newest passion, as it were, um, which is space. We're going to be talking about first light, so the first light to exist in the universe in terms of visible light. So we want to talk about what is light first. So the light that you're most familiar with will, of course, be optical light, visible light, the light we use to see all the objects around us. But that small section of light is only a, a small part of a much larger spectrum. So you have radio light, for example. This is the kind of light which can transmit information over really large distances and uh, keep that information intact. And so this is how we can listen to Ken Bruce on Radio 2, even though we're in Scotland and he's recording in London. Then we've got um, infrared light, and this can help us track out these criminals across the, um, across the terrain in these US cops uh, TV shows, for example. We've got UV light, which you can decorate yourselves with in clubs. Apparently people do that, but I'm more familiar with its use, for example, on uh, CSI when they're trying to track down bodily fluids in, in gruesome crime scenes. And then you've got x-rays, for example, and x-rays can pierce the skin of the body so that you can see not only our bones, but hints of, for example, chest infections, which I think is shown here. And these wavelengths of light as we call them you have all these different wavelengths in the spectra from your large wavelengths as radio to your smallest wavelengths which are like x-rays and gamma and that relates to different kind of energies so radio energies are quite low but they're really really useful and it's radio that we're going to be focusing on today so when you go to the doctor for example with a broken arm you will firstly they will look at your arm and go oh my goodness me you've got bones sticking out of it clearly there's something wrong but also um they if they're a good doctor they won't stop until they've done an x-ray to see the real damage so we use these different kinds of light in combination and apart to diagnose lots of different um things about the universe around us and we can do that within the universe so we can use visible light, for example, to form most of the astronomical images that you will be used to today. This is a galaxy. Uh, it's surrounded by stars, as you can see, um, so that actually if you measure a galaxy by the extent of its light or its radiation, then this galaxy has suddenly got a heck of a lot larger than what we thought. And we can also see inside this galaxy because the only thing that can really create radio lobes like this, we think, are black holes. So suddenly we've gone from a galaxy which looked perfectly pretty and perfectly lovely in visible light, but we didn't really know what was going on inside it. We use radio light and suddenly we reveal a hidden black hole. That's pretty cool. So we're going to be using all the wavelengths of light in astronomy, but we're going to be concentrating on radio tonight. So we've talked about all the different kinds of light, and I want to talk to you now about another property of light, a property of all of those different wavelengths, which is the speed, the speed of light. 
Now, the speed of light is really, 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 really fast, like 300 million meters per second. So incredibly fast, so fast that it can travel over ridiculously large distances in a very small amount of time. For example, if you were waving at your friend on the moon, then that wave, the, the visible image of that wave, would only take one and a half seconds-ish to get to your friend. And it would only take one and a half seconds-ish for your friend waving back to get to your eyes on Earth. And so that delay is very small, you know, two and a half seconds around that. Um, you barely notice the delay. And so you're happy because your friend's waving back. If we go to Mars, though, that your wave takes a whole four minutes to get to the, your friend's eyes on Mars. And it takes a whole four minutes for that wave back to get to you. By that time, you've waited eight minutes for your friend to wave back and you're really pretty annoyed and you've probably walked off. If you start waving at your friend, probably an alien in the next uh, galaxy along, which is Andromeda, then that light takes 2.5 million years to get there and 2.5 million years to get back, by which time you're not just really sad, you're also very dead, which is not any good at all. But what all of these distances, what all of these delays mean is not just that it takes a really long time for stuff, uh, sorry, it takes a really short time for stuff to get back and forth, but it, what it means is that we're actually seeing that wave happen in the past. So when we see Mars, we see Mars as it was four minutes ago. When we see the moon, we see the moon as it was one and a half seconds ago. And when we see Andromeda, we see Andromeda as it was 2.5 million years ago, which actually means if we just reverse that for a minute, that our alien on Andromeda isn't just seeing us on the Milky Way watching TV and having cups of tea or whatever, they're looking at the Earth 2.5 million years ago. So they're not seeing what we are today. They're seeing one of the earliest um, ancestral branches of the human, which is this fellow here, which is really quite incredible <laughs> if you think about it. But this is the key to cosmology, which is the understanding of the whole universe and the really large scales of it. Because what this does is it allows us to look back in time what we do is we tune into the light, which has taken a long time to get to us, which we look further away. We're looking at objects which are older. And so using this, we can start to fill in the lifetime of our universe. All we need to do is look a bit further back and we're seeing back in time. That's quite a useful property to have. And it's all down to the speed of light. So we can be pretty smug about how much of the lifetime of the universe that we understand. So first of all, in our local neighbourhood, we understand the Earth fairly well. We're standing on it. We understand Mars and the Moon fairly well. Certainly we can land probes on these, uh, these entities, <laughs> these planets, as we have with Mars this week with Perseverance. We can go back further. Um, we can look at galaxies nearby 2.5 million years ago. We can go back even further. And we can use the Hubble Deep Field, so the Hubble Space Telescope, to peer so deep, so far away, that it's seeing galaxies from around only a billion years after the Big Bang. So that's going back, you know, 12, 12 and a half, 12.8 billion years. Now, if we go even further, we can actually look right back to the very start of our universe, well, just after, I should say. So we've got a huge amount of theory which surrounds the Big Bang. We understand um, a lot about it, which I'm going to go get on to now. Um, but we can also even image it. We can image the leftover radiation of our Big Bang. And so that's not the topic of the talk tonight. Uh, we'll go into it a little bit in a minute. But take my word for it at the moment, that we can take a snapshot of the universe as it was 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So we've really filled out our lifetime of the universe. So we can be pretty smug as astrophysicists until you notice that there is a yawning gap in there. And that's what we call the era of the first stars. And it's within this time that we don't have 
any observations. We don't know what was going on there. We don't know how our universe got from basically being full of a whole load of radiation to this incredible diversity, which is the Hubble Deep Field, which um, I'll show you later in all its glory. So what was going on in that time? And it's incredible to think that we're missing that much information because what that is equivalent to if you if you compared it to a human lifetime is that you would be missing everything from the moment of birth right up until that child's first day at school. That's a huge amount to miss in a human's lifetime. And you have to wonder, what are we missing? Those years are so formative in a human lifetime. Uh, they're going to be formative in a universe's lifetime as well. So it's well worth having a look, really. <laughs> so one of the um, first questions we want to ask is, was there a first star? Because if we believe that the universe has existed as it is at the minute forever, which a lot of people believed in the early 20th century. Um, I don't know any person, I don't know anyone personally that still believes that now because of the amount of evidence against it. Um, but it's worth exploring because if there wasn't a first star, then we can end this talk now because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the first of something. We can only have the first if there was a beginning. The evidence for the Big Bang is pretty solid. So one of the biggest pieces of evidence is the movement of the galaxies. When we look around us at all the other galaxies around, what we see is that those galaxies are all moving away and they're all moving apart from each other. Now, the only way you can really explain that is if they were all flying away from each other now, if you extrapolate backwards, it means that they all flew away from a, a central point. Um, and that's one of the main um, pieces of evidence for the Big Bang. There was a big explosion. There was a big explosion somehow that flung all of these galaxies away. And so we know, I would go into more evidence in terms of the radiation as well. Um, it's not the focus of my talk tonight, so I don't want to dwell on it. But there is a second piece of evidence, which is that we've actually discovered the background radiation of this Big Bang. So when there's a big explosion on Earth, not only do you see debris flying everywhere like the galaxies, you also, you know, shield yourself from the incredible heat, the incredible light of this explosion. And it's that leftover radiation that we've actually managed to detect. So it really is a double whammy. We're pretty sure, well, no, we're sure <laughs> that there was a Big Bang. Uh, so there was an evolution of the universe from beginning to where we are now. So hopefully I've convinced you that there were first stars. There's a motivation for us to look for them tonight. Why should we care? <laughs> so there's a few reasons to care, and I'm hoping that I'm going to keep you, keep you logged on to this call when you know these reasons. The first one is that missing data leads to incorrect conclusions, and this is a fundamental of science. If we imagine that we are trying to understand an average human lifetime and our research alien from Andromeda happens to be taking a trip to Earth, then what they might do, because they are like research scientists on Earth, they're hard pressed for money, they're hard pressed for time. So all they do is they have a look in a few select areas of Earth. They look in a nursery, they look in a nursing home, they maybe look at a baby toddler club. But then they go home and they think, OK, this is all the data I've got. I know that goes there. I know this goes there. Ooh, I've got a gap. What's going on? Well, if they happen to overhear ideas of a stalk and, a, for example, and this is how babies are created, then they think, hmm, this is an interesting idea. Actually, this fits my data perfectly. And so if you don't have a proper sample of your data, then you can easily make incorrect conclusions and never know about it. And so what on earth are we missing? What on earth are we getting wrong by having that whole period missing from the timeline of our universe? We're pretty sure that we are going to be making some incorrect conclusions. So it really is worth filling that in. The second reason to care, and this is the, the reason I care the most, is that the first stars themselves are extraordinary. 
So this is a picture of our sun in all its glory. It's um, absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> um, you can see lots of sunspots. You can see solar flares. You can see the radiation all around it. Um, it's really, really beautiful to look at. And just to remind you, possibly, that um, the reason that these stars, such as our sun, uh, produce all of this light, produce all of this heat, which is essential for life to thrive on Earth, for example, is that they do something called fusion. And all we need to know for the purposes of this talk is that fusion is when you push smaller, um, smaller, uh, what do you call it, uh, atoms like uh, protons and, and neutrons. You you and you shove these two protons together. Um, and they create a heavier atom. And when you create this, this heavier element, lots and lots of energy is produced. And so by fusing these elements together in ever, in ever more complex reactions, you release more and more energy, and that energy has to go somewhere, so it's radiated out um, as light that we see it. So you have this fusion engine at the centre of each star. The first star is just the same. It's powered by fusion, which is great. Um, but it's, this is an approximate image, which I have knocked up on PowerPoint <laughs> using an artistic filter. Um, but there is some truth to this in that we know uh, that the first stars will have been blue, uh, almost certainly, because they were of such high temperature. Uh, they will have been around a million Celsius on their surface compared to around 6,000 Celsius that we see on the sun. So they were already a lot, lot hotter. Um, and the most interesting thing is that they're always, they were also much more massive. So these first stars, we think, were around 100 solar masses, maybe even up to 1,000 um, times the mass of our sun which is really, really pretty huge. And I'll get on for the reason that they, they form so large in a minute. Um, but they, they form from such a, a simple gas in the very early universe that they simply they can't radiate away their heat, they can't condense. And so you end up with these massive stars, these massive hot stars. And they're also possibly extinct, which makes them all the more interesting because there are there are dead species. Um, I'm going back to my Egyptological days here. I find it fascinating and psychologically <laughs> how I ended up going into physics. And I could have done anything like look at quantum computers and I still managed to make it about opening a tomb um, and looking for something long dead. But there you go. That's that's for a psychiatrist to, to, to look at. <laughs> um, so the reason that we think they might be extinct is because there's a really handy relationship when it comes to stars and how long they live. And that's all based on how massive they are. So what was the mass of that star? If a mass was fairly small, like uh, our sun, if a star um, about the size of our sun, then that will live for around 9, 10 billion years, of which we're about halfway through with our sun. Whereas if you've got a star that's much more massive, for example, 100 solar masses, then what you will find is that it will only live for one million years, which is tiny. It's the blink of an eye, cosmologically speaking. And the reason for this is that when you have a very high mass star, then the pressure of all that gravitational pressure of all these layers pressing down on the core, causing more and more fusion, then that fusion happens at a much faster pace. And so even though they have more hydrogen to fuse overall, these more massive stars guzzle their way through their fuel at such a pace that they run out much, much quicker than um, a, a star like our sun. And so if these first stars, which we think were created around 13 billion years ago, um, so 13 billion years ago, around know, probably even 13 and a half billion years ago, actually. Um, and if they were created then and they only lived a million years, then it doesn't take much maths to figure out that they couldn't have survived until the present day, 13 billion years later. 
So there's not much hope, possibly, <laughs> in terms of looking at one directly. And these really, so these really are extraordinary stars. They're extraordinary stars to try and understand because they're gone. Um, and if that's not reason enough, then let's give you a third. The third reason to care is that these first stars were responsible for the biggest change in the universe, pretty much. The universe evolving from an incredibly dark, boring place with nothing going on to a place where I can be giving a talk tonight. There's human life, there's complex life, there's solar systems and galaxies and planets and black holes. And it's because of the first stars. And the way the first stars did this was they evolved the universe in terms of how much heavy elements that were in the universe. We categorize our stars in well lots of different ways, but this one category system is how many heavy elements they have in it. And we call these metals. So how metal um, full is a star? Stars like our sun, we call them metal rich because they've got loads of heavy elements in. Um, and I should say before I go on, actually, that when I, I'm going to say metal a fair bit in this talk, and this is an astronomer's way of rounding up the periodic table. So we're used to rounding up um, huge distances and huge speeds. And so what we do is we round up the periodic table as well. Now, the universe is predominantly made of hydrogen and helium. That's what was around after the Big Bang. That's all that was around after the Big Bang. And so what we do is we don't really care about the rest as astronomers. So we just say that everything else was metals. Forget the rest. We've got hydrogen, helium and metals. That does us. And so when I say metals, I mean any element that's heavier than helium. So when I'm talking about a metal rich star, I'm saying that it's got lots and lots of elements heavier than helium in. And actually, it's worth mentioning that even though I say metal rich, uh, what I mean is that these stars actually only have 2% of uh, heavy elements, metals in them. So stars are al always made of predominantly hydrogen. But as we go further back to older stars, what we found is that they were metal poor. They had less metals in. And it didn't take uh, anybody too, <laughs> too switched on to figure out, figure out in the 1950s that, hang on, if the older stars are metal poor, then what about the older stars in our universe that existed in a time where there was just hydrogen and just helium after the Big Bang? They must be metal free. And it's these stars that we search for, the metal free stars, the first stars. And the way that these uh, stars cause such an evolution in the universe is that after the Big Bang, you couldn't get anything complicated. It was so hot. There was so many photons just zipping around, electrons zipping around, that it was like trying to build a Duplo tower in a nursery full of hyperactive children. You can build a tower, but it, it will get knocked down pretty soon. And so you cannot create heavier elements than helium in the very early universe. So when the first stars formed out of just this hydrogen gas wandering around, um, you start to coalesce a cloud. Um, I can't go into why it can't cool down as efficiently, but without metals, what you get is much larger gas clouds and much larger stars, much hotter stars. Uh, and these stars, they sorry, these stars, they fuse just like normal stars. They fuse elements. So even though they started out, metal free they started out pristine what they're doing is they're starting to fuse hydrogen they're forming carbon nitrogen ox oxygen lots of heavier elements and when these stars come to the end of their lives boom they supernova and they fling all these heavy elements metals weren't in existence in the universe before they fling them into their surrounding um, universe they pollute the gas we say so that very quickly you pollute the gas so much within one generation of stars that you you by definition cannot form one of these metal free stars again because the ingredients are corrupted and it's the stars it's, it's the way that they 
they polluted like it sounds awful but they they um, seeded the universe with all of these heavy elements all of these metals that is responsible for taking us from a very dark very black universe to around 200 million years after the big bang the first stars and around a billion years after the big bang you've got the first galaxies and they're they're incredible incredible entities that we see today in such diversity for example in the hubble deep field where every speck of light on here is a galaxy and the incredible thing about this image right is that it's um it covers a patch of sky about the same as a 5p piece held at arm's length and so you have this many galaxies just repeated all over the sky in that area and it's just mind-blowing yeah hopefully i've hopefully not all of you have logged off because one you know you will have figured out one reason to care in that bunch, uh, or maybe all three will have convinced you. But let's go forward understanding that the first stars were truly extraordinary. So what we want to do now is we want to go from a rubbish artist's impression to actually seeing these first stars, actually observing these first stars in person. How can we do that? Well, the first way is looking back in time. And luckily I've already given you an introduction into how we look back in time and it all hinges around the fact that the further we look back the longer that light has taken to get to us and so we are tuning into light from 2.5 million years ago as we look at Andromeda so we see it 2.5 million years in the past so all we really need to do if we're trying to look at the first stars is get a telescope that's really good at looking really far away. It can pick up that faintest of light from really far away. And we look so far away that the light has taken 13 billion years to get to us. Nice idea. But unfortunately, the light from these first stars is so faint that by the time it is it's stretched as it comes across to us over the expansion of the universe, it's just too faint for our telescopes to pick them up, our optical telescopes anyway. What we do instead is we use radio telescopes and that's what I use predominantly. Radio telescopes look very different to optical telescopes. They can look quite disappointing. I call it down to earth astronomy because it really is metal sticks in a desert. And these metal sticks are um, prototype square kilometer array antenna. Um, and you can see they kind of look like Christmas trees, uh, lots and lots of jumbled metal all together. And what you do is you put 130,000 of these somewhere really quiet, like the Western Australian desert or the Karoo desert in South Africa. You link them all up and they act as one huge telescope. And that huge telescope has very big ears. And it can, it can detect this radio light from 13 billion years ago, even though it's really faint. Now, it's not the radio light from the stars themselves that we pick up, because that radio light would be just too faint, the same as optical light. What we do instead is we look at what impression, what footprints those first stars left on the environment around them. So what we do first is we take the temperature of that hydrogen. So hydrogen consists of one proton and one electron uh, zipping around it in an orbit. And what happens is when um, basically you change an alignment in that atom, who cares what, um, hydrogen releases a lot of radiation itself. It releases lot of, lots of what we call 21 centimetre radiation. And that's just because it's a special kind of photon which has a very specific wavelength, but it doesn't really matter. What matters is that this hydrogen produces a huge amount of radiation, so much that we can actually really easily detect it. Mm, easily, <laughs> regretting that. We, we can hopefully detect it with our telescopes with a lot of work. Um, and the idea is is to take the temperature of this of this gas to see how much of it there was. Um, and we, that's what we call temperature, see how much of it was um, in order to see what's happening in the evolution of our universe. So very early on, you've got loads of hydrogen and it's pretty cold because there's nothing much in the universe. Then the first stars switch on about 200 million years after the Big Bang. And they do what stars do best. They start to heat. They start to 
push out a whole load of um, heat and they heat their surrounding universe and they heat the hydrogen. So we see it warm up. And what we see eventually is that actually the stars don't just heat the hydrogen. They do what's called ionize it. They burn it all away. Um, they separate out the electrons from the protons. So you get none of this radiation anymore. And we measure nothing at all. So by looking at the temperature, the amount of that hydrogen coming towards us, we can really understand what's happening. Uh, we can understand, oh, look, there's the first stars. These are the first galaxies. And we can tell from this kind of temperature how much they were as well. This is me standing in front of the telescope we're using at the minute. Uh, this is called LOFAR. These are bow tie antenna because they kind of look like bow ties. Um, and they're just stuck under a whole load of tarpaulin in the Netherlands. It's very flat. So that's quite useful for us. Um, it's quite underwhelming, isn't it? There's no clean rooms, no rocket launchers here. It's um, us and a constant battle with mice nibbling our cables. <laughs> um, it's, it's very down to earth. But what we can do with it is incredible. The idea is, is to kind of build up images of this early time. So we, in what we call the dark ages, when nothing much was happening, what we would see with our radio telescope is just a huge amount of hydrogen. So let's just call it red. We've got lots and lots of this radiation. We just see a, a whole patch, a whole patch of it, all one color. Then we start taking images. We tune our telescope so we're seeing things a little bit closer. And the first stars have formed. And when these first stars form, they burn away. They ionize the hydrogen in their surrounding area so that they kind of blow bubbles. They burn bubbles away in this hydrogen so that you get an absence of that radiation. And we call this kind of a Swiss cheese model for obvious reasons. And this, uh, these are the actual footprints. We can see this kind of thing. We, we see bubbles which contain hundreds of first stars, in fact. And then we get onto the galaxies. And they produce a different kind of bubble altogether. They produce really wispy, really large bubbles in this hydrogen so that we see a very different kind of image. And looking at these different shapes of bubbles, looking at when they appeared, how they appeared, whether you get some wispy ones, some Swiss cheese ones, we can really infer what was in the universe back then. We can go the other way. We can get these images and say, ah, that's when the first stars came Oh, look, there's some galaxies there, lots of black holes. It's a really, really exciting um, thing to be able to do. So it might look, I don't know, I guess quite underwhelming compared to a Hubble Space Telescope image of a galaxy. But what you've got to remember is that we are looking 13 billion years ago at the very beginnings of our universe. And we're actually building up images, a home movie of our universe over that billion years. So at the minute we're using LOFAR, as I said, we're putting antennas everywhere. Um, so for the SKA, we're putting down, you know, 130,000 of them to begin with and linking them up. With LOFAR, we've, we're using more like uh, 3,000, but putting them really far away. So all over um, Europe, really, um, and joining them up again to make a massive uh, telescope. And the reason um, that it is hard, why well, well, I stumbled earlier and said it's easy, and I was like, no, it's not easy, is because um, the radiation from this time uh, is covered with everything else that happens to have been in the way in 13 billion years and happens to have been producing radiation that covers up the um, this, this signal from that hydrogen, the signal from these first stars. And the galaxy itself is like 10,000 times louder than the first star signal. So that's a really difficult problem to unpick. And the only reason we can is because these signals look very different. It's like listening to um, your radio and a pirate radio station coming in. If you're listening to classical and the pirate radio station is heavy metal or swap them according to your preferences, then you can actually tell them apart intuitively because they're very different sounds. And that's what I do in my daily job. I use statistical methods to separate out these two signals. Now, the next 
task to do is that's what we're doing with LOFA. So we're looking at these statistical signals. We're trying to find a first ever detection of this time. Um, I should say that we're, we're not there yet. We are 10 years into our mission, boldly going where no one's gone before. Um, and it's hard. We're pushing down continuously to the level where we can expect to detect this signal. And this is a golden age for this topic, because I really do believe that it's going to be in the next few years, next couple of years, next year even, that we make this first detection of that time. And as astronomers, when we have one foot in one experiment, we're always planning the next experiment 10 years ahead. Well, the SKA, the Square Kilometre Array, is following very swiftly on the heels of our current generation telescopes like LOFAR. We're putting antennas on the ground in maybe the next year, um, and they are going to look like the Western Australian desert has got measles. Like I said, 130,000 of these things are going down. Eventually, actually, it's going to be closer to a million if we get the funding to go on to the second stage. So this is a really impressive instrument. And it's this instrument that's really going to revolutionise this field because we're going to be able to get those incredibly high resolution images of all the different kinds of bubble and build up that home movie with, you know, this isn't a simulation. This is an actual home movie of a billion years of growth. And we're really going to fill in that timeline. Um, I won't go into that at the minute because I want to get on to something more exciting. Square Kilometre Array is awesome. The UK government's behind it, which is great because they're giving us money. Um, they're giving us money because it's an incredible instrument, not just scientifically, um, but also in terms of pushing industry. So the data rate is one of the biggest data rates in the whole world because we're listening to the entire universe over 13 billion years. And if you consider how much bandwidth you need to download a, an episode of whatever you're listening to, then you can imagine how much bandwidth and hard drive space we need to store all that data. So we're pushing fiber optic cables, companies and all this. And that's why we have countries all over the world fighting over themselves to be involved in this project because of the technological advances that we're going to hopefully create. So I'm hoping I've got a little bit of time to talk to you about my other love in this area, which is not just looking back in time with radio telescopes to see the footprints of the first stars, but the possibility that we might be able to look a little bit closer to home. And that's using something that really is called stellar archaeology. I didn't make it up just for the purposes of my, my past loves. Stellar archaeology pretty cool. It's the idea of being able to stumble on one of these first stars in our own back garden in the Milky Way. How, you ask? Because haven't I spent the whole talk telling you that these first stars were massive and therefore lived, lived fast and died young, as they say, a million years? What hope have we got of seeing them 13 billion years later? Well, as I mentioned, when you have low mass stars, they can live a lot longer. And when we simulate these first stars, and this has only happened in the last few years because we need increasing computer power, but what we've noticed is that while you have these central massive first stars, actually what we're starting to see in our simulations, now we've got higher resolution, is sibling stars. Is we see some smaller stars being born just after that first star. Some of them survive, some of them don't, some of them are kicked out of the system. And some of them are as small as 80% the mass of our sun. Now, if they were 80% the mass of our sun, then that means that they could have lived 13 billion years or longer, which means that they could still be in our backyard. The difficulty is that, yes, we've got metal-free stars that could have survived until the present day. So why don't we just find one? Why don't we just look and say, there's a star that looks very different. It's got no metals in it. Well, because they're camouflaged, if they have been around for 13 billion years, even if they are metal free, they've managed to collect a huge amount of metals that are just lying around in the gas that they're traveling around. And so it's a stellar archaeologist's job to look at all the stars around them, and they all look pretty similar, and say which star is most likely to actually have a first star underneath, which star is the camouflage one. And that's not an easy task because stars look much alike. 
and the key for this is um, looking very carefully, uh, look, knowing to look in the right place. And to continue my Egyptological analogies, what's never mentioned in these stories is that Howard Carter didn't just stumble across Tutankhamun's tomb. It's often depicted that way, like he just, just happened to be digging in the right place in the desert. Actually, he'd been digging for five years and he meticulously dug in a perfect grid across his assigned bought land. And he looked and he didn't find anything and he looked and he didn't find anything and he looked and he didn't find anything. And actually, Lord Carnarvon, who was giving him all the money, said, that's it. I've had enough. You've had enough. That's it. You are cut off. Which point Howard Carter says, please, just one more dig, one more dig. Guess what he found? on that last dig which is just incredible but you know untold riches one of the greatest archaeological discoveries in all time um and yeah but it took five years it took meticulous searching and that's what we're having to do with stellar archaeology we're dividing the milky way up into areas and we're looking where we think they might be but we're just not sure we're looking at the light from a star and that light goes over all these wavelengths, you know, invisible from blue to red. And we're looking at what is in that star. So we look at how these elements within a star affect the light that we see. And so, for example, calcium produces a special barcode on that spectra of light. It, it um, absorbs the light at very particular points, very particular colours. And we lose it if there's calcium. We get another dark barcode line if there's iron another one if there's carbon and so the aim of the game is to find lots of stars look like this with a certain dark barcode but some stars are going to look like this with a much more subtle barcode so a lot much fainter one which means that there's less calcium less iron less carbon and so what we want to do is we want to keep searching until actually we find one of these spectra which barely has a barcode at all, which is almost a complete spectra because it has no metals in it. And we've got really, really close. We've managed to find a second generation star, which can tell us a huge amount about its um, its immediate ancestor, the first star, it can tell us kind of how massive it was, what kind of supernova it died in. That's really exciting. But we haven't quite dug down enough to get to that metal free star, but we are tantalizingly close, which is why I keep saying that this is the golden era for this first light science and which is why I'm so excited to have brought a little bit of you today to you today. Um, so the what we want to do in this next golden era age of the next five to ten years is go from we can detect the first stars to we have detected the first stars. And we want to fill in that universe's timeline. We want to have this complete timeline so that we can make correct conclusions around our universe today. We can complete our understanding about its evolution and we can see something that has long been possibly, possibly most of them have been long extinct um, and beyond our uh, ability to see. And with that, make incredible discoveries of which we just don't know what's coming, which is the most exciting thing. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope you've enjoyed something, part of it, <laughs> and been motivated to understand that understanding the first stars is well worth your time. Well, thank you very much, Emma. That was a wonderful talk. <laughs> Good. We'll take a short break now for everyone to get a drink, get rid of the last one, or do whatever else you need to do. Um, short reminder, while we're gone, you can ask your questions. I'll, put, I'll, I'll give you the, the link again, sitp.online forward slash ask. You can put your own questions there. We're happy if you don't just put it anonymous, anonymously, but also put in your name. And if you like the questions there, then uh, you can upvote them so we can make sure that we talk about them as much as possible. Good. So that's it. I guess we'll be back at about 8.05 UK time. All the others will know what that means. So see you again in about 15 minutes. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Good to see that there's so many of you still around. 
Thank you for all the questions we have received so far. That's actually quite a nice number. But who knows, the best question of them all might still be out there. So if you still want to ask it, go to sitp.online forward slash ask. Um, after the talk, as usual, we'll open our online pub, the Lockins Razor, and we invite everybody to join us on Zoom. You will find the links in the chat very soon. Before we go to the Q&A, I wanted to introduce to a friend of mine. We call him the Skeptical Education and Activism Enablement Bear, or for short, the Sean Bear. And he will travel around Europe and UK in the next few weeks to visit all the organizers of Skeptics in the Pub Online. Um, we do this with a purpose that we will reveal in time. But for now, if you follow our social media channels, you will see much more of him in the coming weeks. So I hope it will be interesting. Good. Let's talk about the Q&A. Emma, we've got a lot of questions. Let's see how many we can do. First question from Andrew. Are there any directions looking out into space that seem to have more first stars or their progeny and can help us know the location of the Big Bang? So this is a really interesting recent area of research in terms of the first part of this question. Um, and what we're noticing when we kind of look at the different hydrogen patches across the universe in this very early time is that they're very patchy. And so that these first stars, we think, came to life in quite a patchy way in the different areas of the universe ignited these, these first stars at, at different times. And so we, we can't necessarily pick a direction. We don't know which direction is going to be where there are more but we can notice that there's this variation across the sky. In terms of knowing the location of the Big Bang, no, there's not any research that I know of that can link the two at the minute. Okay. Good. Igor, our Russian friend, asks, will new stars form in the distant future? Will they be different from the old ones? Or I guess the current ones, he also means. Yeah, okay. Another really interesting question. Um, and not necessarily my area because I'm I'm back there <laughs> yeah. But um, I can say that star formation has dropped off massively. So we think that star formation peaked actually around between 9 to 11 billion years ago. And ever since then, it's been dropping off. So there's less and less stars being created every you know unit time. Um, will there be more stars? Uh, yes, we can look into stellar nurseries right now and watch stars being born. Um, that will continue to happen as long as there is gas around that can coalesce and form it. But in the distant future, as the universe has expanded so much that we all get separated out and the gas cools down so much that it can no longer form stars, then no, you eventually will get to a point where you can no longer form stars at all, which is sad. <laughs> Knowing Igor, he most likely had hoped for heavy metal rich planets. Okay. <laughs> okay, we've got a question from Anonymous. How does a low does a low far on the scale of the Australian one affect the local wildlife? Do you get things nesting on it, attacking it, etc.? Yes, you absolutely do. So this is why I love astronomy and I keep calling it down to earth, because um I think we are one of the only scientific collaborations which, when we have our meetings, we have um, a whole session on animal control. Um, so, for example, LOFAR in the Netherlands, we had like a 30-minute session on it because there was this one awful season, and I'm not making this up, where we had mice chewing the cables. And so we thought, how can we get rid of the mice? We So we bought in birds of prey. <laughs> And we bought in the birds of prey, and that was great. It solved the mouse problem. But then we were, we were finding that antenna were going missing in our data. And it turns out that, that when these birds of prey were landing on the antennas, they were knocking them over and nullifying them. <laughs> and so then we had to get rid of the nerds of birds of prey. And then we found a protected group of, um, I can't remember, with otters or beavers, whatever's, whatever's native to around there. Um, and they were steadily coming closer and closer to the telescope. And because they were protected wildlife, there was nothing we could do if they came into our telescope area and destroyed the lot. Um, so it was a very tense season. And luckily, they turned around. Um, but it's the same in the, in Australia when we're building that. It's it's wearing metal boots to to ensure that the snakes don't bite your ankles. 
Um, we try not to have a negative effect on the wildlife. As far as I know, we don't have a negative effect. They have a negative effect on us. <laughs> well, that's good. Okay. Oh, Igor again. Does it make sense to speak about generations of stars? Each contains elements forged in a previous generation. Does the star composition make a difference? Yeah, there's lots of different ways we can talk about classifying stars. And generations of stars is, is one that we use. Um, so population three, we call them, are, is an yet another name for metal-free or first stars. Um, and the way this originated is that we called the, um, the last generation, the ones around us, the younger stars, we called them population one. They were the first ones we found. Then we found the older stars, the more metal rich stars, and we call them population two. Um, and then suddenly we discover these metal free stars that they exist. And so we call them population three. So even though they're the earliest generation, we call them the, the kind of like the third <laughs> generation. Okay. If you reverse that again, I'll just very quickly say that there's another way we can use generations, which is. I think the way Igor means, actually, which is that you have the metal free stores, which are the very first generation. And then immediately you have the second generation because you can no longer form that first generation. Absolutely. Each generation that goes uses the um, the seeded metals from the last generation. So it's a constant recycling, constant recycling till eventually you get a star which has so many dust, so much dust, so many metals in that it can start to form planets. Um, and that's what happened with our sun. So we think that there was around three to six generations of stars before our sun formed out of all of that. Okay, good. Okay, Chris asks, can you get your head around how much, can you get your head around how so much matter or energy was contained in such a small space before inflation? No. <laughs> 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 no one can if anybody says they can don't believe them they don't understand it um it's it's it was a third year cosmology course at university that basically said exactly that that there's all this stuff in the big bang and i was like what that doesn't make sense i've got to understand more about that and went into astrophysics so no nobody knows that okay good question we don't know the uh, name of the person who asked it is how did you manage to swap between Egyptolo Egyptology and physics at uni wouldn't you need physics and mathematics a levels yes yeah, so it wasn't actually at university I swapped it was when I was choosing my a levels um so I I was originally doing history and all that jazz ancient history and all that and then I picked up this book and I found out that Egyptology jobs were incredibly rare the two went together literally overnight I swapped to maths physics for the maths um and had a career change <laughs> very quickly. Yeah, I've had a similar thing, so I know what you mean. <laughs> Trevor Smith asks, sorry if this is a daft question, but do you get pictures on radio telescopes? Never a daft question. And yes, you do get pictures on radio telescopes. It's just that they don't look as um, intuitive as optical telescopes. But uh, I showed that very early picture of the radio lobes. Um, and you can absolutely build up pictures using the different radio elements. So you can see radio galaxies and you can see all the different parts. It's just that it's at a different wavelength and you can color it whatever color you want on paint. It's just that it won't kind of have all those optical elements. But yes, you can absolutely get radio images. Rishi asks, what type of contemporary stars are the closest match to the first stars for size and other characteristics, or does nothing else come close? Um, ooh, really good question. Um, in terms of mass, size, um, yeah, you can get blue giants, um, and blue giants are kind of one of the, the later evolutionary stages of stars, uh, very massive stars. Um, they, they are close, but they're metal rich. So that that's always the clincher, is that you can get things that are quite similar in a lot of ways, but the metal content is completely unique to the first stars. Mm. Good. Derek asks, how do you know how far back you're looking? Redshift? Yes, so um, absolutely. You, you know how far back you're looking by how look how uh, the wavelength of the radiation that's arriving to you so we know 
that that radiation was emitted with a wavelength of exactly 21 centimeters because we understand hydrogen really well. We know that it was 21 centimeters. We can then calculate how much it was redshifted, how much it was stretched due to having to fight against the expansion of the universe to get to us, loses energy, it gets stretched, it gets stretched, it gets stretched. And we figure out that a 21 centimeter wavelength will have been stretched to a wavelength of around two meters um, if it's had to go through a universe of 13 billion years, if it's been traveling for 13 billion years. So we tune in our telescope to a wavelength of two meters, and that means that we're looking back to that distance. And then if we want to look back a little further, we know that it will have been shifted to 2.1 meters. And so we, we, we do okay. it like that. Oh. Good, what are we next, Phil? Looking out into the universe, we look into bigger space, but back to a time when the universe was smaller. What practical effects does this have on observations? Um, quite a bit, actually. It's a bit too technical to get into now, but it's called um, what we call the light cone effect. And it's exactly what you've said is that as you as you look back, you are your kind of your field of view spreads out. So you're looking at the same kind of angular uh, section but as you look back you're seeing more and more and more um, that means that the kind of the universe that you're looking at is evolving at different times and it's a different I can't go into it but yes it does have a, the fact that you are looking back um, into a, a larger area does absolutely have a, a practical effect basically it makes your image a little bit more fuzzy um, because you're collecting radiation from kind of different sizes and so it basically just makes your images a little bit fuzzy but yes it does have an effect okay i'm interested in that so you you had that example of the five cent coin earlier yes five cents coin so if you have a piece of sky that is covered by a five pence coin, if you want to go further back it would be a, a larger coin that you need to look out for or yeah so it would almost it because because the angle to that coin has yeah. a, you're looking at if you imagine light going there and you've got two lines and it fits into a 5p coin if you go further back those that you're looking at the same angle but your lines are deviating and so while it was a five cent coin here it's a plate <laughs> here okay. um, and so it gets it gets bigger and bigger and bigger the the further you go back so it's it's yeah it's okay thank you for explaining that Good. Sim asks, has the balance of stars in galaxies and stars out of galaxies changed? Do you see hints for why galaxies are bunched up the way they are? Yeah, so it's only very early on that you get stars um, predominantly on their own, uh, <laughs> floating around, as it were. Um, what happens is that uh, very early on you have these first stars forming, very quickly, you have the second stars forming and you have um, little clusters of those, according to dark matter, which we've not been through at all. You have little clusters of dark matter, little clusters of stars. And when around 10 of those clusters have been attracted to each other and combined, you get what we define as a galaxy. It's big enough to be called a galaxy. And that happens all over the universe so that very quickly everything comes together and you get these individual galaxies very quickly, about 500 million years after the Big Bang, I'd think that. <laughs> um, and since then, because all the hydrogen's kind of mostly been swept up into these galaxies, you just can't get star formation in between them predominantly. So, yeah. Okay. Good. Another anonymous question. Can you really get a star named after you or is that just a massive con? <laughs> you can really get a star named after you, but it is a massive con um, because <laughs> there are enough stars in the Milky Way alone that every human could claim several of them. So, yes, technically every human could name a star, but nobody owns the stars. And that's the beautiful thing about astronomy. It's the thing I love is that it's um, it's not about the property of one country or the property of one person. Everyone can look at the sky. Everyone can think they own whatever star they like. It's no skin off my nose. There are companies which will put your name next to a random number which has been assigned to a star and make you pay £25 for it. 
if you want to do that you do you but you know you can also print that off yourself and it would be just as true so <laughs> okay good garnet asks how much do you think the jwt will change our understanding of the early universe Will it be a real game changer or an incremental advance? Yep. So what we mean here is the James Webb Space Telescope, um, which has been supposedly ready to launch for the last decade, but is reportedly going up in autumn this year. Um, it's a nine billion dollar telescope, which is kind of the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's going to be able to peer back really, really far, um, which is great for us. It's mainly infrared. Um, in terms of a very early universe, we're hoping that it's going to see very, very early galaxies, which is great. Um, in terms of the first stars, there is the intriguing possibility that it, might, it won't be able to see the first stars, but it might be able to see the incredible, incredibly bright supernovae that they, they died in. So if these supernovae are bright enough, um, then the James Webb Space Telescope might be able to pick that up. Um, and so we'd see the deaths of the first stars, which is pretty cool. That sounds great. OK, we've got a question from Nadia. You study things that are so unfathomably massive or far away or long dead. Has this affected your attitude to problems here on Earth in any way? Yeah, so I kind of just um, referenced this. Um, yeah, it's it can be it can be quite almost depressing and depressing and uh, anxiety attack inducing to consider how small we are um, and how insignificant we are in terms of the timeline of the universe um that can be quite daunting having to face that on a daily basis for your day job um <laughs> but you also understand how incredibly lucky we are to be alive right now how lucky we are to have a sun that is stable, a galaxy that isn't currently colliding with another galaxy, that we are alive when Saturn's rings are at a beautiful angle. And it's an incredible, incredibly serendipitous time to be alive. And so it really makes me feel very lucky. Um, and as I said, uh, everyone owns the sky and you have astronomers coming together from around the world While their politicians are fighting, you've got astronomers coming together in one room, not caring at all about the politics, and stop fighting for to plan for a telescope 20 years ahead. That's that's incredible collaboration. And so it make it restores your faith in humanity. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's great. Good. Um, well, actually, uh, as related to that, the next question from Derek. Have your international collaborations been affected by Brexit in any way? So far, not game changing way. Um, it it's it's all up in the air. Uh, in what matters about science is is how much research funding you get, and most of our research funding, and I'm talking like 70, 80 percent, something stupid like that, um, in in the UK came from Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and so and so when you lose that you start to wonder what are we all going to do but very recently we think actually the the, the european um space agency and all of the major collaborations are still going to let us in <laughs> kindly um uh, so that that's really good um i think yeah brexit is going to cause all kind of funding cuts right as is this current covid situation um research is going to be cut massively there's going to be problems let's hope that let's hope that this science survives that yeah fingers crossed good let's see next question john f asks was there a period where the universe was all one color when photons could travel between particles but before clumps and bubbles? I'm not quite sure of the meaning of that. Um, I'm not sure about the, what he means by the photons could travel between particles. Um, but as, and I'm not really, yeah, uh, I can talk about the color of the universe in that that has evolved over time. If you take the average color of everything that's emitting radiation in the universe, then you can actually see the universe go from white hot after the Big Bang 
to um, completely black in the dark ages, blue when the um, first stars form, yellow when you go uh, into the second generation. And then now they figured out that the average color of the universe right now is something called cosmic beige cosmic latte <laughs> it's like the most boring color in the whole world it's literally beige and they just came up with cosmic latte to make it interesting for press release um yeah so you can trace the color over time and people have done that and they've even made an artwork out of it where they've made a disc with all these different colors on and they spin it there's an art in okay. art, art installation so it's really cool okay so the sp space is the color of uh, an average human aura then yeah <laughs> <laughs> good we've got a question from leon does gravitational lensing help or hinder research of the first stars um, this is directly related to JWST. So I didn't mention it there because uh, I wasn't sure I could explain gravitational lensing. But um, for Leon, <laughs> um, when JWST looks back to see these light from the supernovae of the first stars, it's still really faint. And so the only way we're going to be able to see it is if there's a massive cluster of galaxies in between, which takes that light and literally lenses it just like any lens you have, lenses it around the galaxy and then it can it can come to us kind of magnified. Um, so, yeah, it will really help in that respect. And I don't know of any way it's going to hinder. OK. Good. Good. Question from Claire. Hi. How do you explain the pyramids and other similar structures creating a grid to the stars? Um, this is a bit of a tricky one. Um, not my area. I know that a lot of this can be put down to coincidence. A lot of the a lot of the things people say can be put down to coincidence. But you know, you can't argue that that some of these things they do align quite well. Um, I think it really comes down to the fact that humans have been interested in stars since they were intelligent enough to look up and realise that these stars had some meaning and some difference to what was on Earth. Looking at the stars has been important for the evolution of uh, culture. You know, we used it for navigation of the seas. Uh, the Polynesians were doing that way before anybody else in the world was. Um, you used it for timekeeping, for knowing when to plant your crops in agriculture, it's not surprising that they then use them in some kind of like religious decorative purpose as well. Um, yeah, there's there was a huge amount known about the skies thousands of years ago. Yeah. Okay. Question from Grady Earthling. Can we map the position of the ionization bubbles and correlate them with present day structures in the universe? Amazing question. I've got a PhD student working on this project right now. Um, so absolutely, you <laughs> absolutely you possibly can. <laughs> so absolutely, this is a great question. Um, yes. So what we think is that, um, I mean, it's kind of intuitive, right? If you have a, a huge gal a cluster of galaxies or whatever, a really bright galaxy, then it stands to reason that that would have um, given out a huge amount of radiation and created a, a nice big ionization bubble. Um, we've, we are going to have pictures of these bubbles. We have got pictures of galaxies really far back, like Hubble Space Telescope ones of the optical. What we're trying to do is figure out if you know where all of these galaxies are using Hubble or something like that, can you predict where a bubble is going to be? Uh, it's an open question. It's something we're doing right now. Um, yeah. It should be really interesting to do. Cool. Question from John. What is the biggest technical challenge you face in measuring the early universe? That would be, um, there's two, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say there's two equal actually. First of all, it's how large the, what we call the foregrounds, what we call all of the galactic and extra galactic signals that pile on that um, first star signal. So it's, you know, around 10,000 times larger. That's a huge challenge, uses um, really like modern and intricate statistical methods to separate it out. The second challenge is the instrument itself. Um, any kind of telescope also emits radiation itself. Um, and just the radiation, just the electromagnetic interference of the instrument itself. And actually, 
um, of any nearby mobile phone, plane, wind farm, electrical fence keeping cows in, which is a problem we have in the Netherlands. Um, we can pick up all of that. And again, that's like 10 times larger than the signal we're trying to find. So it really is just constantly trying to strip away all the noise on top of our signal. Okay, question from Peter W. What would the universe look like for someone sitting 10 billion years from us? Still 13.8 13 billion years old? Yes, so, oh God, this is a tricky one. This is the one that makes your head spin. Um, yeah, let's let's say we're on Andromeda. It's not 10 billion years away, it's 2.5 million years away, but we can extend the analogy. Um, even though we see Andromeda as 2.5 million years old, they also see us as 2.5 million years old. So it's relative. And the time that they've existed still remains the same, even though they see each other differently. And so we're both sitting in a universe which is 13.8 billion years old. And so you can still extend that further and the universe would still be 13.8 billion years old. Okay, another question from Anonymous. As the galaxies are speeding up and not slowing down, how does dark matter factor into the Big Bang? Okay. Um, Dark matter is is incredibly important um, for the earliest stages of structure formation. So whereas the galaxies are speeding up, the expansion of space time is speeding up right now, and that's due to dark energy, whatever that is, nobody knows. Um, dark matter, after the Big Bang, I said that everything was very dark, very boring, mm. nothing much was happening. Actually, <laughs> under the scenes, so if we're talking about not visibly, Invisibly, behind the scenes, the dark matter was coming together into filaments and it forms what we call the cosmic web. And this literally just looks like a, a spider's web, gorgeous, gorgeous web of dark matter. And it's only because of that that the hydrogen gas could use it as a scaffold. It was drawn in gravitationally and it's only that that brings in the hydrogen enough to ignite fusion. And so without that dark matter scaffold, we would never have got the first stars, the first galaxies and the universe. Well, I can't even imagine what the universe would have been like without dark matter. It wouldn't it wouldn't exist in any way, any recognizable way. OK. Question from Sim. Does the size of the universe, not the visible universe, impact your models? What do you assume for the size? Um, we assume a really tiny patch of universe. So we cannot possibly simulate the entire universe because our computers would explode. Um, so what we are forced to do is simulate representative patches. So patches that are large enough that we can assume that We've got a representative idea of everything that's kind of going on in the whole universe, but, but in this patch. So we've got all the kinds of galaxies, all the kinds of stars that might exist. Um, and I'm trying to think of, of a way I can describe that in terms of the size. I can't really. But it's a very small patch of universe. And even that can take six months for a computer to uh, fill out a proper simulation of, of what's going on with the galaxies. It's, it's a huge amount of computing power. That's what we're limited by at the minute in terms of the theory. Okay. We got another question from Pete H. With inflation, is there a limit to how far back in time we can look? And when will we, or when would we, or future species lose the ability to see the first stars? Don't know the answer to the last question. I've never figured it out. Um, but my intuition, my gut feeling uh, is that it would be way, way, way after humanity has been extinguished by the red giant of the sun and Andromeda crashing into us. So I don't think we need to worry about that. Um, <laughs> but, yay! But, but the first One part... Thing um, the <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, there is a limit to half out how far back in time we can look, and we've already looked. Um, it is that cosmic microwave background that was 380,000 years after the Big Bang. 
that is when all the photons are, um, we say the universe has become transparent. And it's because everything has settled down enough in terms of all the atoms and everything whizzing around. that Suddenly, the photons, the light can come to us with a nice clear path. And so we can see what's going on. But it's like um, up before that, everything was so crazy that the light and the photons were bouncing around like in a pinball machine. And so it's just meaningless. It's kind of like um, if you've dropped a coin on the bottom of a, a swimming pool, if it's very calm, you can see it quite easily. But if you've got tons of people churning the water, the light's there, but you, you just cannot see that coin. And so you cannot see before the cosmic microwave background. Sounds like a professional theatre production shortly before the curtain lifts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we've got a question from Laura. Is the second generation star that you found in our galaxy actually still there? Are any old stars found closer to the Earth still there? Uh, yes, the second generation star is still alive and kicking. Um, it's, yeah, it's going to live, well, a, a lot longer. We'll never see it die. Um, so yes, it was small enough that, that it will, it will live a long time because the second generation form with much lower masses. Um, mm. so that will happen. I'm not quite sure of the meaning of are any old stars found close to us. Um, yes. So yeah, um, you will get these kind of second generation stars and possibly these camouflage first stars. If we find them, you will get them around the galaxy. They're unlikely to be that close to Earth because um, the spiral where we sit of the galaxy of the Milky Way is where mostly young stars are. And what happens is that over time you get the older stars drifting upwards, drifting away into the halo of our galaxy. So that's where the old stars live. Mm -hmm. And so they're not they're not going to be they're not going to be so close to Earth. They're going to be found up there. Okay. Good. We've got a new question from Mark Stablehurst. Very interesting. How much data would be in that one photo? I assume it is an ultra high resolution. I guess he's talking about the uh, Hubble. Hubble. Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Yes, it is ultra high definition. Um, I, I couldn't actually tell you because I've only ever taken that data from the NASA website where it's been condensed into a nice little JPEG. <laughs> 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 so I can't, can't give you information beyond the JPEG. <laughs> so you've never downloaded the petabytes? I have not. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, next question is from Jay Schoen. If the first stars went supernova, wouldn't they have left neutron stars that are around in our neighborhood today? Would we recognize them as such? So this is all dependent um, on how large the first stars were. Um, the stellar endpoints of life, how they die, whether it's um, a supernovae or black hole, whether it forms a white dwarf, or whether it forms a neutron star, all depends on the mass of that star. Now, we think that most, most of the stars we've simulated in terms of the first stars, um, they are massive enough that they fall into the bracket of something called, uh, impressively, a pair instability supernovae. Um, and what that means is just it's a really bright kind of explosion and it's such an energetic explosion such an energetic supernovae that it, it, it leaves no remnant behind it doesn't leave a black hole a neutron star or a white dwarf there is no gravestone everything is blown apart and that is why these first stars are so efficient at, cr at creating the metal content of the universe because every single part of them gets obliterated into the surrounding universe. I see. I uh, see we've only got a few questions left. Um, I've got a question, a further question from Anonymous. What would it mean if you do not find these first stars? I understand that this is still a thesis, not a theory, right? Yeah, um, it would mean that our technology is not good enough. Um, everything uh, in terms of Big Bang Theory, there, there is a first star. And we know from Big Bang Theory 
that the, 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 there were not heavy elements in the early universe. We can see there are heavy elements because I'm made of carbon and oxygen. So I exist. So I know there are heavy elements. There must have been something in between where they were created. So we know they exist. So it's not a case of, oh, there weren't first stars. It's a case of maybe they were a little bit different than we thought. Maybe they are more massive, for example, and have died much quicker. I don't know. Um, but almost certainly it's because we've not got the technology. And there are some amazing missions which are planning to go to the moon uh, to do this kind of observation, to land um, antennae, uh, antennas on the far side of the moon where it's much, much quieter, um, blocks out the Earth and the sun. Um, and we can we can observe in a very quiet universe. And so we will find them. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. <laughs> well, we'll pick you up on that Sunday. <laughs> Good. We've got a question from Colin. Will quantum computers make the models much faster to run? Yes, absolutely. Quantum computers will make everything faster to run. Um, and so, yes, but we are way, 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 way away from that. And I think we'll have found we'll have found the first stars by then before, before quantum computers become a reality in terms of this kind of model making. Okay. The last question. Was the first light from the first star in the visible range of radiation? Yes. So you would have been able to see it. Um, they emit the first stars emit over the whole range of wavelengths, just like our sun does, just like all stars do. Um, but what it throws out kind of mostly are very energetic UV photons. So mm -hmm. you see it very brightly in the UV. Um, all stars do slightly differently. It's one of my favorite facts about stars that I'm going to wedge in here to finish off with <laughs> is that the sun is actually green. Um, and that is because it emits over all the wavelengths, but it peaks at the green part of the optical wavelengths. And so actually, the, the, if, you, if you define it by the most light it emits, the, the sun is green. And the reason we don't see that is actually because there's lots more wavelengths and they all get mixed up together. And so we, we see a bit of a yellower, redder sun. Um, yeah, so it's, it's cool. And yes, we would have seen them. Okay. That concludes our list of questions. Thank you very much, Emma. That was highly enjoyable. <laughs> Thank you. again. Thanks again also for your talk. And for you out there, um, I just have to make a few more announcements. Number one, we'll open our pub online. Please see the instructions in the chat on how to join. And the other thing is, next week, we're looking forward to welcome Professor Dr. Marianne Fisher. And her talk will be titled, Mummy Dearest, The Myth of the Maternal Instinct. So hopefully many of you will join us again. If you want to have a look at our website at sitp.online, you will see also our published program for the next few weeks. I think we've announced up until the middle of March already. So there's plenty interesting stuff coming. Have a look. Well, that's it for tonight. All that I have left to say is once again, thank you very much, Emma. I hope the chat is exploding with applause and clapping now. And other than that, Stay safe, stay healthy, and all stay skeptical. See you again soon. <laughs>